Amen. Well, go ahead and grab a seat. Glad you're here tonight. This is the second to the last night of our Need to Know series, and really the last night of teaching for the most part. This next Wednesday, which will be our last in the series, is just going to be a time of questions and answers. So if you have Bible questions, you can bring those. If you don't have questions, it'll be an early night. So, But it's good to see you tonight. First of all, right off the bat, I want to say that as we're talking about biblical prophecy, as we're talking about what the Bible says about what is going to occur in the future, it's an area of great interest for people, but it's also an area of great controversy. It's one of the areas where Christians tend to divide and disagree the most in terms of you know, people who believe the Bible who love God, come up with various interpretations of the book of Revelation, about Ezekiel and Daniel and other books that we take as being predictions of future things. In fact, there are really good people, some of whom don't even believe that these books are speaking about the future at all. They believe that it's talking with a, in an image sort of way of what's occurred in the past. So, I, you know, I do, I'm going to share with you my best shot at how to interpret these things. I can't possibly cover the whole topic of everything that you would ever need to know about Bible prophecy, but I want to give you some, some tools that just might help you to delve into it a little bit and to give you some caution about areas where I think sometimes people can get carried away and ultimately um, fall into error. I mean, th there's, there's really no area more than biblical prophecy where people have a chance to be wrong because you see things that, you know, it looks like this is happening or this is going to happen, and over time, sometimes it doesn't. But this is an area that should, every area of theology is this way, but especially in this area. It should demand our humility because these aren't simple things. If it was simple, I, you know, anyone who believes the Bible takes it seriously at all agrees that Jesus died for our sins, that he rose from the dead, that he is in heaven, that someday he will come back. These are things that are clear and on which we can just stand on. How we interpret difficult passages of scripture, particularly in the area of biblical prophecy, we should still do it. Um, there are some people who just ignore the book of Revelation because, oh, people disagree on it so much. But, but right there in the book of Revelation, it starts out almost with a promise for a special blessing to people who will study it, to people who will read it. So we certainly don't want to neglect this as an area, but we certainly want to deal with it with the spirit of humility, with the idea that I'm doing the best I can to understand this. I believe the Holy Spirit can help me in that. But at the same time, I'm not going to hold to my interpretation and think that anyone who disagrees with me is an idiot. It's easy to get it wrong. People who I greatly respect have made predictions over and over again that turned out to be wrong. And they were totally well-meaning. I mean, the, a person who, Pastor Chuck, who, I mean, I, there's no one I have ever revered more than him, but he was convinced that Jesus was going to come back by 1981. And he didn't go name a date. But here's how he figured it out. Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, that when the fig tree blossoms, he said that this generation won't pass away until all of these things will be fulfilled. So it seemed like 1948, when Israel became a nation, boy, that's a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. So you add a generation, which is 40 years, and then you subtract seven years for the tribulation period, 81 has to be it. And I totally bought into that. I, I go... That totally makes sense, and I was really excited. Um, it didn't throw me off when it was wrong, because especially towards as we got towards 80 and 81, Chuck would say, look, 
but nobody knows the day or the hour. This is just what I think. And I appreciated that. But there are some people who have lost their whole taste for biblical prophecy because of predictions that didn't come to pass. Over the years, there were people who wrote books talking about Henry Kissinger's going to be the Antichrist or Javier Solano or different people who have since really passed from the scene. Um, there were statements that said, you know, there's a 10-nation confederacy that, that, that Daniel talks about. And, wow, look, the European common market, which doesn't exist anymore, has 10 nations in it. So we're, it's about ready to come down. Well, the European common market did not turn out to be the Rome that the scriptures predicted. It didn't stay 10 nations. It got way more than that. And then it evolved into the EU that has a lot more than 10 nations. So Bible prophecy people aren't still saying those kinds of things. The reason why I bring that up and why it's something that we should take seriously is if you're old, as I am, you see this stuff happen over and over again. Now, if I got up here and I said, you know, the book of Revelation or Ezekiel 38 is this ISIS going across Europe right now, and you are seeing biblical prophecy being fulfilled on a daily basis in your newspapers, you can see it. You know, people would love that. They would eat it up. But I'm old enough to know Things come and go like that, and you really, I really want to be careful, even though, yes, when I look at what's happening in the world, and I see tie-ins with what the Bible says, I see a situation, a condition, for instance, that I go, wow, this is exciting to see. Maybe, maybe it's here. Maybe this is the time, but we need to be careful because we don't want to lose credibility by telling people things that... A year from now, it turns out you're, you're wrong. And so I'm appealing for, you know, a, an amount of, of humility as we look forward to it. It's so easy to get this wrong. And I'm not, I'm, if, you, if you came thinking that I'm going to explain how everything that's happening on the news this week is showing that Jesus is probably going to come back by the end of this year, you can leave now. Because I, I believe Jesus could come back while I'm talking. That would be awesome. I absolutely believe that he can come back at any moment. But I also believe that he can wait as long as he wants. Because Peter says this. He said, you know, don't think that God is dragging his feet. He said, like, don't think that he's slacking off as some people count slackness. He said... No, he is patient toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So I don't feel bad that Jesus didn't come in 81, even though I thought he would. You know, I totally agreed with that interpretation. How many of you got saved since 1981? There you go. That's why we ended up with egg on our face, thinking it was going to be 81 because God loved more people than we realized. And so if it ends up that, you know, there's still another 500 years of human history before this occurs, it just means God loves even more people. So I, I'm okay with that. At the same time, I always enjoy seeing when conditions in the world at least seem to more easily yield themselves to an understanding that what God says is going to happen is actually going to happen. It does become more credible, certainly all the time. So let me define a couple of major terms that we're going to talk about because these terms are involved when we, when we try to come up with an interpretive rubric for, you know, okay, how do we interpret the book of Revelation? How do we interpret prophecy? And the first one is a millennium. Millennium just is a Latin term that means a thousand years. But the millennium is a 1,000-year period of time when Jesus will come to earth, return to earth, and set up a kingdom for a 1,000 years. And we'll look at a scripture that show where we get this. But 
it's a, it, it, some people would say the millennium isn't literally a thousand years, that that's a figurative term. So, but at any rate, the reason it's called millennium is it says it's a thousand years. Jesus setting up his kingdom on the earth. The second coming is not a, usually a referral to the rapture of the church because, and I'll talk about the rapture in just a moment, but the second coming is when Jesus, as has been predicted through the Old Testament and the New, that he will, you know, return and judge in righteousness, set up his kingdom, but his feet will land, you know, right there in Jerusalem and he will reign from Jerusalem his second coming is when he comes to earth physically. The tribulation, it's also called the time of Jacob's trouble, the 70th week of Daniel and other things. Tri tribulation is a, comes from a Greek word, philipsis, that just means pressure. But the tribulation is, the way, the way I see it, seven-year period of time, and we'll look at some scriptures that support this, but a seven-year period of time that's yet future where God is pouring out his judgment on a Christ-rejecting world. So when we talk about the tribulation, we're talking about a time when God is radically judging the earth for rejecting Jesus. And then the rapture of the church is a, and we'll look at some scriptures about it, but the rapture is a time that is predicted. Some people believe in it and some people don't. But it's a time when he, um, primarily in 1 Thessalonians 4, we see the clearest description. The word rapture, by the way, people will say, well, that's not used in the Bible. But it's true. But the, the word in 1 Thessalonians 4 is you'll be caught up. And, and that's just rapture comes from a Latin word that really means the same thing. But the rapture is a time when, and and it's imminent, it could happen at any time, when people who have trusted in Jesus Christ are actually taken up into the air, meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, as Paul says. So we're, that's, those are the terms, some of the terms that we're going to use. Now turn over to Revelation chapter 20. Is that me? <laughs> nice. <laughs> In Revelation chapter 20, the first several verses here at least, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Can you hear me, by the way? Can you hear me? Okay, okay, cool. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshiped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. And you can go on and read the rest of it. When the thousand years were expired, Satan's released for a short time and then ultimately thrown into the lake of fire. So, <laughs> Revelation chapter 20 says there will be this time when Satan is bound and when Jesus Christ reigns on the earth um, and people on the earth will benefit from the fact that Satan can't do anything. He, he and his angels are locked up and that happens for a thousand years, it says several times. And, and at the end of that time though, there is one last battle after the thousand years. So, the real question in terms of eschatological systems becomes how do I interpret Revelation chapter 20? How do I interpret the millennium? Is it something that is future? Is it something that is currently going on? Is it something that is literal? Is it something that involves Israel or 
Is it instead something that involves the church? So these are the kinds of questions that we want to look at when we decide how do we interpret what these prophetic scriptures say? Because if you believe, for instance, that we are now in the millennium, that's going to affect the way that you read biblical prophecy. If you believe that this was just symbolic and it's, not, you know, it, it's non-existent, that's a whole different thing. If you believe, as I do, that this is an event that is predicted because it will happen before the end of the world, before the end of the age, that's going to send you in a little different direction in terms of your perspective on prophecy, okay? Now, common millennial views. Here are the basic schools of thought that, that would interpret this whole uh, future things scenario in different ways because of um, decisions that were different on how to interpret the book of Revelation and Revelation 20 in particular. So the first one that I put there is amillennialism, which is if you look at church history, amillennialism is probably the predominant view of Christians throughout history. Um, it, and ah, you know, the A is negative, not, and millennial means no millennium. So all millennialists don't believe in a future thousand year reign of Christ. Um, let me say this too, though. A lot of people will today advocate for all millennialism because they say for all of history, you know, practically of all the church history, Amillennialism was the interpretations of most of the believers, followers of Christ throughout the last, you know, 2,000 years. Even though that's true, that doesn't make it right. There are things, for instance, if you, and we're going to talk a little bit about whether or not Israel has anything to do with the future is a huge question. Well, Israel didn't exist for most of church history. So you just can't completely blame people for not imagining that maybe these prophecies are actually literal, will happen in Jerusalem, but we'll get to that. The, in the mind of the amillennialist, the millennium started at the resurrection of Jesus, that Jesus has been ruling and reigning on the earth ever since then. He rules the church. Now, you'll hear term, a term that's called replacement theology. And it's, it, I, I try not to use the term because all millennialists don't like to be accused of replacement theology. When people say replacement theology, what they're saying is, you believe that the church took the place of Israel, and therefore you exclude Israel. They don't even matter anymore. What matters is the church. I don't like to use the term because, for one thing, it's pejorative. People who believe this are insulted by calling it replacement theology. But the reason why they don't call it replacement theology is because they say, no, the church didn't take the place of Israel. The flow of the people of God just, you know, there was an, when Jesus came, it changed everything. And at this point, now, all of those promises are going to be fulfilled to anyone who accepts Jesus as their Messiah. And so rather than replacement theology, they would really just say, no, it's, it's just the natural flow of what happened. And, and I'll, I'll give them that. I, I'm not going to fight over that issue. But really what it does come down to is, is God ever going to do anything with Israel ever again? as Israel as a nation. And so all millennialists would say no. Now the scriptures that they would use, well like Romans chapter nine is one of their favorites. And Romans nine without reading the whole passage, but just verse six, it says, but it is not the word of God has taken no effect for they are not all Israel who are of Israel nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. So, and what Paul is saying in Romans 9 is, just because you have Jewish blood 
does not mean that you are someone who is following the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So if Paul's distinction in the passage, he makes it clear that being Jewish is important and does matter. And his heart is just, he would give up his own salvation in order to save his Jewish brothers. But because he said, hey, just because you're Jewish by blood doesn't make you a fulfillment of the promises to Israel, to the faithful of Israel. And so they take, basically, for, for a great degree, they take Romans 9 and leap from there to say that all of those Old Testament prophecies, and there are a ton of them, that prophesy a future kingdom where, you know, where the Messiah is reigning and where God is fulfilling all of his promises to Israel, they would just go, well, he's doing that in the church, and they would say he's doing it now. One of the problems of this uh, amillennial position, and people who are amillennialists don't like to talk about it, and many of them don't feel this way, but it was historically the amillennialism, the idea that the church basically was the fulfillment of all the promises to Israel that caused a lot of the anti-Semitism that was there. There's the, the history of the Catholic Church is a history of horrible anti-Semitism for which only recently have they, the Pope has begun to apologize for their entire history of hating Jews. Um, in in the, the Reformers, Calvin, Luther, Zwingli, those guys, they hated Jews. And a part of it was because they felt like, you guys are nothing. You rejected Messiah. He came unto his own and his own received him not. We are the true fulfillment. You don't matter anymore. And it's a very strong feeling. It's a very, you know, it, it's just, it runs deep. Because it's hard to, you know, feel like, it's hard to explain, for one thing, why Israel is still even here. Why in her wars does it seem like they were supernaturally protected? Why is it that Jewish people are, they dominate every major award that there is, whether it's, you know, the science awards or math awards or the comedy awards or the acting awards? You, the, the Jews are just such a tiny part of, of the world population, and yet they're just so dominant. Some people hate them for that. But I look at it and go, this has God's hand all over it. I don't think he is finished with Israel. That's why I'm not an amillennialist. But there are some good people who are. Some amillennialists do believe in a rapture, but they believe it comes you know, right before the eternal state. So in a timeline, they would say, we're in the millennium, don't know how long it's going to last. But someday, some of them would say rapture, some not. And then we move right into heaven, a new heaven and new earth on that point. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the amillennial position. The reason why I tend to reject that position is partly because of Israel. I just like, come on. You, I can understand why you'd be amillennial before 1948, before seeing what happened in all these wars and everything. But then when I read the Old Testament and I read the prophecies about the future, it, it is like, it's all about the geography. It's all about the place. It even is in Revelation. It's like, no, the, these are promises that were made to a specific people in a specific place. Now, I don't, I don't think we take the place of that. I, I don't think it's fair. And it, a part of why we get confused on this too, I think, is because we aren't a collectivist society. You have to understand that for the Jews as a collectivist society, they're fine as long as they know that someday their descendants will receive the fulfillment of these promises. For them, that covenant with God is one that was with their people, where we would have a tendency more to feel like, no, I've, we're individualistic and we want it ourselves. But when you read the Old Testament and you take it seriously, it's kind of hard to miss the fact that 
Number one, the promises that were made were very specific and Israel directed. And number two, many of these promises have not yet been fulfilled. And so that's an issue for me that if he says, here are what the borders of your land is going to be, I will bring it about. And then you look and historically Israel has never had those specific boundaries. Either you have to say that God didn't do what he said he was going to do, or you have to, for me, I look at it, I don't think he's done yet. I think he's still going to keep his word. So, but I love people who are on millennial. There are some really good people who are on millennial. I don't blame them for thinking that. They don't believe it because they're stupid or ungodly. But for me, that amillennialism is unsatisfying because of, you know, partly because I try to take the Bible as literally as I can. And I have to look at Israel happening now and everything that God has done for her, even though, let's face it, most of the Jews in Israel are atheists. And yet still, there's this land and there are these people and there is this opportunity for God to fulfill everything that he said he was going to do. Now, another position that's probably less common is post-millennialism. Used to be more popular than it is now. It's still... Um, a lot of Christian television is post-millennial. And ironically, a lot of younger, hipper people are starting to move a little more towards a post-millennialism. Post-millennialism is that the millennium is yet future. They disagree with the amillennialists. But they would say the millennium is going to come at an undetermined time when we do everything that we are supposed to do. When you hear people saying, we need to win this world for Christ, we need to go forward, and we all of the motivation for changing society and taking over politically, frankly, a lot of the most adamant you know, advocates for political causes are actually motivated by a post-millennial idea. The idea that we can make the millennium happen, we are going to bring it about. The kingdom will gradually take over as Jesus is ruling from heaven. So they generally say, it's not a thousand years. It's obviously, it's been, we've been trying to take over the world for a long time. Th this was, I mean, when Constantine was, was running Rome, when he was the emperor of Rome, that was the whole notion. We're gonna bring the kingdom of God in ourselves. This was also, the, the guy who's most, who was most known for this brilliant man named R.J. Rushdeny, who was dominion theology to the core, and he really believed, we need to bring laws into place whereby we take biblical law and we make it law on the earth. And some people aren't consistent enough to know this, but when people think that we are going to change this world and, and we are going to put Jesus on the throne and we want to do... That's all dominion theology. That's all post-millennial kinds of thinking. Does that make sense? Because it's like, yeah, we need to do what we can do so that the millennium will occur. Um, most... Now, it's really hard to get this out of scriptural prophecy, so, uh, you know, other than just in a twist... So most post-millennialists are what we call preterists. A preterist, as opposed to a futurist who believes that the book of Revelation and other prophecies are for the future, preterists explain away most biblical prophecy by saying that was already symbolically fulfilled. So when they read, as we're going to look at Revelation, all these plagues and everything like that, the dominion theologian, the post-millennialist, the, the preterist will, and there are some partial preterists who are amillennial as well, but, but they try to say, yeah, this was probably 70 AD, fulfilled in 70 AD when Titus came in and wiped out you know, Israel, basically. The problem is the book of Revelation was written after 70 AD, so then they make it historic. It's the same kind of thinking that when they look at the book of Daniel and the prophecies that Daniel makes, they say, 
that was fulfilled. He was prophesying concerning things that ended up being fulfilled even before Christ came. So they tend to be preterists. So what do we believe? And there is, uh, you know, there are a few other little things I could go into, but don't really have the time. I would categorize myself as a as being premillennial, which means that Jesus is going. The pre part is Jesus is going to come before the millennial, before the millennium. Um, a a postmillennialist says Jesus is going to come once we accomplish the millennium. An amillennialist is like the millennium has nothing to do with when Jesus is going to come. They all believe Jesus is coming, but. You know, a premillennialist says Jesus will come and set up a thousand year uh, time of rule when he fulfills all those Old Testament prophecies and, and obviously Revelation chapter 20 as well. And I probably, it, when you talk about premillennialism, usually they also lump it in with dispensationalism, which I don't like interpreting the Bible based on dispensationalism, but a dispensationalism, a dispensation is that God deals in a specific way with his people at different times. God dealt with Adam and Eve in an age of innocence in a different way than he dealt with the children of Israel during the law. Or, you know, the gospel period was kind of an interesting intermix, and then you had the church age, and so generally you're going to be categorized as a dispensational premillennialist if you believe that God is going to shift his program to a degree during that tribulation period and even during the millennium where he fulfills things that he said he was going to do, but it's not the same as right now. So there are different times where God does different things. Basically, I'm not crazy about the term dispensationalist, but at the same time, God does whatever he wants. And when you look at what he does, he certainly does seem to do different things at different times. The book of Revelation as a timeline and interpretation, and we will go through uh, in just a bit to kind of, from my perspective, where, you know, how the book of Revelation unfolds and, and outline it a little bit. But, but the... The understanding of the book of Revelation for a premillennial dispensationalist is that, you know, most of the book of Revelation is the time of great tribulation, of tribulation, and, and we'll look at Daniel 9 in just a moment. But so you have, there's the church, then you have the tribulation period, then you have the return of Christ, and he sets up his kingdom in Revelation chapter 20. Then you have the destruction of Satan, you know, forever to be put in the lake of fire. Judgments all happen, and then we are in the new heaven and the new earth, and that's how it ends. So when you look at that flow, I'm not looking for how could the, the seal judgments be taking place today. I'm seeing it as future, and it's somewhat a decision you make, but it's an informed decision. Turn over to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel was an amazing guy. <laughs> one, of the, one of the greatest characters in, in the Old Testament, certainly one of the, one of the smartest guys. And he, uh, he made some prophecies concerning actually even as much as when the Messiah would come. And Daniel is probably the reason why the, the guys that we call the wise guys, the, the scriptures call them the magicians, the magi, and we know that Daniel was the boss of all the magicians in Babylon, but it's probably why they knew from looking at stars and things why it was time for Jesus to come because of teachings they had from Daniel, some of those teachings that perhaps we don't even have today. But Daniel had these dreams, and some of them involved what was going to happen there in Babylon. Some of them seem to definitely be looking off to the future when you read it. So let's look at Daniel 9, beginning with verse 20. Daniel says, Now, while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God 
for the holy mountain of my God. He was in prayer. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. He had had this vision. Seventy weeks. Now, the word weeks is just sevens. So, seventy sevens are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy, a messianic term. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven sevens and 62 sevens, or altogether 69 sevens. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. And after those 62 weeks, which follow the other seven weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, one seven. But in the middle of the seven, in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Now, to go into this in detail, you can consult my studies in, in the book of Daniel and kind of see more of a breakdown. But here's the amazing thing. Daniel sets the date when Messiah is going to come. And it's, it's, you know, he says, all together, 77s, 490, you know, and it could be 490 anything, but if you take it to be these to be years, then he's saying that when you subtract seven from that, 483 years after the declaration goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, Messiah's going to come. And if you study your history, you can figure out what day it was that the declaration from Cyrus went out to, okay, you can go rebuild Jerusalem, which was future to Daniel, but not much future. You start to count the years, and 483 years later, Jesus entered Jerusalem as an adult to, um, to declare himself to be king on Palm Sunday. Now, there are people that argue with this. There, there, was, there were guys, who, Bishop Usher and others, who made these calculations and nailed it to the day. To this day, when people say, oh, no, that's wrong, that's stupid, they'll say that he was like six days off or four days off. It's like, come on. This was an amazing prediction of when Messiah would come. And I don't know any way around it. So, but then, why have 69 sevens, 483 years, and leave seven years left? And that's where um, premillennial dispensationalists will look at it and go, there is one seven-year period that's still missing from this fulfillment. You do not find at the end of when Jesus came... You don't find, or in 70 AD, you don't find this completely fulfilled in any respect. Many, most of these things aren't, you know, you have to just stretch your history completely to come up with a preterist interpretation of it. So anyway, for me, I look at it as there's seven years that are missing. There's going to be a time that's predicted where this judgment is going to happen for seven years. There's some sort of a shift in the middle of it, as he says, after three and a half years, that this world leader, we call him the Antichrist, will actually, you know, he's going to be killed and come back from the dead, 
then he's going to turn all of his wrath against Israel after having had a treaty with them for three and a half years. Now, when I read the book of Revelation, it's like, and, and even people who don't believe that this is inspired by God would say that John was trying to make it look like this in the future that this was actually going to happen. For me, I trust John. I believe that this is something that God gave him. And the book of Daniel causes me to look at it and say, wow, that's, there's seven years that's missing. We have here kind of the breakdown of what's going to happen during those seven years. And so this Daniel chapter nine becomes a framework with which I then interpret other scriptures and certainly in which I would interpret the book of Revelation as a whole. Again, I could be wrong, but that's, that's why I look at it and I go, wow, this, this fits rather well. Now, another part certainly of premillennial dispensationalism is a teaching in the rapture that because of false predictions and things like that, and, and because the idea of floating up in the air just seems preposterous, a lot of people don't want to deal with the idea of a rapture. But the rapture is, you know, taught in Scripture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 51 and 52, Paul, who is writing about resurrection and things like that, he says in verse 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. Death is swallowed up in victory, he goes on to say. So Paul says, there's going to be a time when some people don't die. They're just taken. You know, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. I don't have a really good idea of what that moment could be that would make that much sense other than what Paul talked about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 where he was talking to the, the believers about you know, they were bummed because some of their, you know, they were expecting Jesus to come back and he hadn't. And so they were sad because some people were dying. And Paul was saying, hey, don't feel bad for them. Verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians 4. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now again, you can listen to my study on 1 Thessalonians 4 now. I go into it in a lot more detail. But to me, this seems clearly that Jesus is going to come with people who have died with him, and instead of him coming to the earth, he's going to draw us up to meet him in the clouds and then to be with him forever. This is what we call the rapture. It will happen in the twinkling of an eye, as 1 Corinthians 15 tells us as well, that, that we, don't, we don't have to die. We're going to in, have this transformation. So if you believe in a rapture, now you have to figure out, okay, where does that happen? Now, even among premillennialists, there are people who believe that the rapture comes in the middle of the tribulation. And, or they'll usually say, I'm pre-wrath. That like when things really turn with the Antichrist, then the rapture comes. Trouble is, the book of Revelation, as it's dealing with this time period, doesn't even hint anything about a rapture happening during the tribulation period. 
There are other people who call themselves post-tribulational rapture premillennialists, and they believe that Jesus is, while he's coming for the second coming to set up his kingdom, he raptures those of us who are alive, and I'm saying us, I, you know, like Paul did, but Paul said we who are alive, but he didn't stay alive that long. I don't care. If, I, if I'm one of the ones that's coming down with Jesus, I'm cool with that too. But, but it's like caught up. Now, if you're a post-tribulationist, then you believe that everybody's raptured and immediately come right back to earth. It's like more of a ricochet rap, boing, boing, you know, and, and well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Pre-tribulation rapture makes the most sense for me, certainly. Now, over in the book of Titus, chapter 2, beginning with verse 11, Paul tells Titus, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us and so on. So Paul is saying, you should be watching because, at a, and we call this the imminent return of Christ. He can come at any time. His whole idea was, I'm watching the sky because I am looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So when I look at this, I think it should be, um, you know, it could happen at any time. It could have happened then. Therefore, I don't believe that it comes at the end of the tribulation or in the middle of the tribulation because then it couldn't really be imminent. The only way to really have an imminent, you know, uh, scene of Jesus show up is if it happens before everything else that we know how long the tribulation period is and so on. And so to keep eminence, you, you kind of have to do that. Um, there... The best, the most literal interpretation of Old Testament scriptures is this way too. Like you can turn over to Isaiah chapter 2. And beginning with verse 1. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, so the whole nation. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, rebuke many people, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. When will that be fulfilled? Because that sounds like the millennium. That sounds like the kingdom. Well, I don't care how you twist your interpretation of history. That hasn't happened yet. There hasn't been a... T and there were all millennialists, by the way, who, who felt like... This was fulfilled after the war to end all wars, World War I, or after World War II. The fact is, nothing like this has ever happened. And it specifically says they will go to Jerusalem. Judah and Israel will be together. So when I look at it, it's like, I'm going to take that literally because I just can't find a legitimate symbolic interpretation for it. It seems like either he's going to do that or he doesn't. Now, I want to avoid um, just saying that I believe in premillennial, pre-tribulation, you know, uh, dispensationalism, because a lot of good people believe in it. Because just because good people believe in something doesn't necessarily make it the case. There are some certainly good people who believe things a lot differently than I do, but just so that you know, this um, premillennialism, everyone from John Walverd from Dallas Seminary, who's a big advocate of it, Dwight Pentecost, 
Norman Geisler, Charles Stanley, Hal Lindsey, Chuck Smith, even Rick Warren, all these guys believe this way. And so I at least take it seriously. Now again, there are some people who are like, well, I'm pre-wrath, I'm mid-trib. That's not a big difference. The reason I am pre-trib rather than pre-wrath is because I believe it can happen at any time. And that really motivates me when I do that. Now, another view that I just wanted to mention is called historical premillennialism. It is people who believe that the return of Christ is going to, you know, happen, you know, and a millennium will actually happen. But it, with a historical premillennialist, the Israel and church are not really distinct. Um, the rapture for most historical premillennialists happens at the end of the tribulation before the millennium. Return of Christ isn't imminent because you see it, you, you can see it coming. They would also say some of Revelation is historical, like the judgments, the beast, all that. They, they would write it off to a couple thousand years ago. Um, they do believe the false prophet's real. They're partial preterists. There are people like George Ladd, Walter Mar the late Walter Martin, John Warwick Montgomery, who tend to, who are historical premillennialists. So they do believe that this is going to happen, but some of it they think has already happened. And, you know, but at least they have the order correct that he's going to return and set up a kingdom, which is a kind of a big deal. So let me just in the moments that we don't have left, let's go through the book of Revelation and so that you can at least understand the flow of it. And if you, if you jot down this outline, it'll help you as you're reading Revelation to kind of know where you are. And again, this is just from my perspective, which for me is the most logical way to, to read the book of Revelation. Um, if you're starting to say, some of it happened at this time, and some of it happened at that time, and some of it's just symbolic, then I don't know how you get a bunch of value out of the book of Revelation, but chapter one is the introduction to the book where there's a promise that, that you're gonna be blessed if you read this thing, which is why even if you don't totally understand Revelation, read it anyway, because you will find all kinds of great things in there, even if you are not an eschatological scholar. But chapter one does that, and then John has this vision of Jesus. And that's kind of takes up chapter one. Chapters two and three are letters to seven churches that come directly from Jesus as he's giving John this to write it down. Um, there are people who, m many good people, who have tried to take these churches and have them represent different eras in church history. And so the church, Ephesus is the first one, and that was just those early days of the church being established, and they always wind it up with this, the seventh church, the church at Laodicea, as being like, that's the modern church today, where he says, you know, you're not, you're not hot or cold, you're lukewarm, you make me sick. Um, the reason why people did that church history thing, and C.I. Schofield was a guy who, of the Schofield Bible fame, is a guy who really promoted this idea, but a lot of other, a lot of good people, a lot of Calvary people hold to this view um, as well. But for me, it's just kind of a stretch. These were seven real churches. Jesus was talking to them about, and, and for me, I don't see, it's really forced to try to see a progression throughout history. The fact is, the church at Ephesus, the first church, you have left your first love. Duh, did that only apply to the early church? Of course not. And as you go through all of these, depending on where you are in your stage of life, depending on where you live in the world, you may be in a time of great tribulation, great problems, great trials. There all, and, and there were lukewarm people that made him sick in the first century. So we know that these are seven literal churches that he wrote to, several of them John knew personally, Paul knew some of the others, Jesus knew them all, and if he says he's writing to these churches, to me I'd just like to stick with he was writing letters to these churches, and these churches probably got the book of Revelation sent around to them in a, in a progression, and 
Thus, that's probably why he greeted them in that way, and I don't see any reason to go beyond that. Chapter 4 is a vision of heaven. As, as he, you know, he's setting up the stage, he's showing this, these 24 elders worshiping God in heaven. He's, there's a scene going on in heaven at some point. And if it was just by itself, you could just go, okay, it's just a vision of heaven. But the progression of the book is important, and, and it's a setup for, in heaven it looked like this, because pretty quickly he's going to start talking about everything that happened on the earth. So chapter 4 is basically um, the vision of, of heaven. And it's interesting, though, that, that after chapter 3, which this whole book is addressed to churches, and the whole letter was written to churches, and throughout chapters 2 and 3, the church, the church, the church, the church, church isn't mentioned again. So that at least gives you an indication that perhaps, you know, during what happens in Revelation 4 and following up until the very end, till chapter 20, that the church is just out of the picture. That's one reason why we tend to believe that the rapture comes before these events because if the tribulation is happening and the church was here, you'd think they would be mentioned. It does mention people who are testifying. It does mention... Jews who are sealed and protected, but it says there are 144,000 of them, and they're not Jehovah's Witnesses. They are Jews because it tells you 12,000 from each tribe. So anyhow, after, after chapter 3, you don't see the church anymore. Chapter 5 is a scene where, where Jesus takes this scroll and eats it. Some people see the scroll as being the title deed to the earth, you know, maybe it kind of is, but the obvious thing is he begins to finally then take a scroll and open it. The way their scrolls work, they had seals, and you could take one wax seal off and unroll it for a while. Then they would have some other wax, you have to break that. So you could see how far somebody had gone into the scroll, and it was like a bookmark to keep your place. So beginning in verse in chapter 6 all the way through chapter 18 you have what we would call the tribulation period and the the way that it's depicted is these seals are being broken and every time he takes out another seal there's another judgment another catastrophe another horrible thing that happens to the earth so you have from chapter 6 through chapter 18, with a couple of parentheses that talk about the history of Satan and some things like that, but, or the economic system and the, in, more in general. But basically, chapter 6 through chapter 18, when you're in there, you are pretty much in the tribulation period, that seven-year period, that 70th week of Daniel, that time of Jacob's trouble. That's, that's where you are. And there are s six seal judgments but the seventh seal judgment introduces seven trumpet judgments. So the first six judgments are seal judgments. The seventh seal is seven trumpets. And each trumpet is, is tooted successively, and each one then introduces another judgment, another plague, another problem on the earth. Now, throughout the whole, and then the seventh trumpet introduces seven bowls whereby there is judgment from God that's being poured out symbolically like a bowl. So in seven years' time, you have six successive seals, then the seventh seal, which opens up the trumpets, then you have six successive trumpets, and the seventh trumpet is the seven bowl judgments. So you're talking about a lot of bad things happening between Revelation 6 through through Revelation chapter 18, no mention of the church anywhere in there, which would be unheard of in a letter written to churches if, in fact, the church was around during the tribulation. But again, you can look at my studies on this and, and get a little more information about that. That brings us to chapter 19, which is the second coming, when it makes it very clear, heaven opened, 
He's on a white horse, faithful and true, eyes like a flame of fire, clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God, which John calls, you know, Jesus the Word in, in the Gospel of John, as you know. And he has on his robe a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so, and they begin to worship him. At the same time, judgment starts to happen on the beast during this time too. So Jesus returns, unleashes final judgment at this point, and then it also says that it's the marriage supper of the Lamb. The church is called the Bride of Christ uh, uh, in, in Ephesians. So this is the time when we finally return with him to the earth as his bride. We are involved in judging the earth during Revelation chapter 20, which is the millennium. Satan is bound in Revelation chapter 20, locked up for a thousand years. Finally, at the end of the thousand years, he's released for a short time because people have been able to live in a perfect world. Some of them still haven't chosen to accept Jesus or not. And even in a perfect world, they were rebelling against him because when Satan is released in, in Revelation chapter 20, or in, in, chap, yeah, in chapter 20, a bunch of people gather with him to fight against the king. And basically, they just get completely wiped out. There's a great white throne judgment where your final decision is sealed if you have continued to reject Jesus Christ after all of this and you were thrown with Satan and his angels into the lake of fire that it says that it's the second death and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So where they would, it said that they would be suffered, judged forever for their works. So that's chapter 20, all of that. And then, and by the way, you won't be judged at the great white throne judgment if you are a believer. Um, we do face a judgment for reward stand. Paul calls it the Bema Seat judgment, which is when we go to be with him, we'll receive rewards for the things that we did in our lives, and that should be a motivating factor for us. But everything in the Bema Seat judgment, whatever it is that you did that was inconsequential, that was a waste of time or energy or your gifts or whatever, it just gets burned up, and you survive holding on to that which meant something for real in your life. And so then we have come with him, and at this point, we don't participate in the second death. We don't have to stand trial once again. It's, we're already dealt with. And then finally, chapters 21 and 22, you have the final state. The millennium isn't the final state. It's a thousand-year kingdom that's set up on the earth, and it's a great time. But once Satan, again, rebels one more time and is completely wiped out and everybody goes where they're going to go forever, now you have a new heaven and a new earth set up. There's no more tears, no more crying. It's this perfect heavenly state that Revelation 21 and 22 talks about. And then Revelation chapter 22 winds up with an invitation. Uh, he, he tells us, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of prophecy of this book. So again, a blessing on those who, who do what he says and believe what he says. But then he says, I'm coming quickly in verse 12. My reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates of the city. The ones who don't get in are all the, all the people who've rejected him, sinners and gross. None of those people will be there. And I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If you add anything to it, you're going to have plagues added to you. If you take anything away, God will take away your part in what he has for you. 
but I'm coming quickly. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you also. He closes with just a personal invitation from Jesus to say, all of this is going to happen, and when it does, and when it's all over finally, the whole point in me telling you about this is because I want you to come to me. I don't want you to go through, you know, Revelation 6 through 18. I don't want you to spend eternity in hell. I don't want you to suffer punishment that was never meant for people. It was always meant for the devil and his angels. So I'm just inviting you. And if you will, it's free. And so I love that with a book that's difficult, it comes down to the end and it's just an invitation to come to him, to believe in him. If you haven't done that, please do. He's, he's appealing to you. He's begging you, please, you don't have to face this kind of stuff. You can be rescued. You can be saved and delivered and you can spend an eternity with me. The only thing that's keeping you from that is you, is your failure to come freely and take of the water of life. So if you haven't done that, do it today. If you, if you, you know, aren't sure how to do that, come on down and talk to somebody or grab somebody around you and say, do you know how to do this? And it would be an awesome thing on a night when we look at the future for you to lock your future in to where Jesus Christ is guaranteeing that you're set. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for giving us previews about how everything ends. And even as Paul says, since we know that everything we see is going to be dissolved someday, what kind of people should we be? Help us to live like we really believe this stuff. That everything around us that we value, other than the people, it's temporary. It doesn't last. If there's anyone here who hasn't come to you, by your spirit, please just draw them to yourself and help them to know their future can be so amazing. Eternity with you in heaven. Lord, I pray that if they need to, that they would just read Revelation 21 and 22 and decide, do I want that world, that new heaven and new earth? Or do I just want to keep going on the slide with a world that is going to hell? Help them to choose wisely and help all of us to live our lives valuing the things that you value, looking with interest at what you have to say about the future, but never getting so sidetracked by being right or so, so tripped out on wanting to argue about this stuff that we stop doing what you've called us to do. Thank you for giving us these predictions. And thank you for making them confusing enough that we should never get real prideful about them either. As we see what happens in our world, we do understand that you are drawing things to a close. May we live with that same expectation that Paul told Titus to have, watching the sky, expecting you to come because someday it's going to be right. It's going to be you. And we long for you. And so we pray even as John prays in Revelation, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We need you desperately. But we submit ourselves to your timing. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.